So acknowledging that there's a separate person and accepting you for who you are. Uh, now, on a slightly, so that, and you mentioned therapeutic, that sounds very like a very healthy view of love. But uh, is there also like a, like, you know, if we look at heartbreak and, uh, you know, mo most love songs are probably about heartbreak, right? <laughs> uh, is that like the mystery, the tension, the danger, the fear of loss, you know, all of that, what people might see in a negative light as like games or whatever, but just, just the, the dance of human interaction. Yeah, fear of loss and fear of like, you, you said like once you feel it once, you long for it again, but you also, once you feel it once, you might, for many people, they've lost it. So they fear losing it, they feel lost. So is that part of it? Like you're, you're speaking like beautifully about like the positive things, but is it important to be able to uh, be afraid of losing it from an engineering perspective? <laughs> I mean, it's a huge part of it. And unfortunately, we all, you know, um, face it at some points in our lives. I mean, I did. You want to go into details? <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get your heart broken? Sure. Well, so mine is pretty straight. My story is pretty straightforward um, there. I did have a friend that was, you know, that at some point um, in my 20s became really, really close to me. And we, we became really close friends. Um, well, I grew up pretty lonely. So in many ways when I'm building, you know, these, these AI friends, I'm thinking about myself when I was 17, writing horrible poetry and, you know, in my dial up modem at home and, um, you know, and that was the feeling that I grew up with. I left, I lived, um, alone for a long time when I was a teenager. Where did you grow up? In Moscow in the Moscow. outskirts of Moscow. <laughs> um, so I'd just skateboard during the day and come back home and, you know, connect to the internet <laughs> and write poetry and then write horrible poetry and was it love so, poems all sorts of poems obviously love poems i mean what what other poetry can you write when you're 17 I don't know. Um, it could be political or something but yeah but that was you know that was kind of my yeah like deeply um influenced by joseph brodsky and like all sorts nice. of poets that um every 17 year old will will be looking you know looking at and reading but yeah, that was my, uh, these were my teenage years and I just never had a person that I thought would, you know, take me as it is, would accept me the way I am. Um, and I just thought, you know, working and just doing my thing and being angry at the world and being a reporter, I was an investigative reporter working undercover and writing about people was my way to connect with, you know, with with others. I, I was deeply curious about every everyone else. And I thought that, you know, if I, if I go out there, if I write their stories, that means I'm more connected. This is what this podcast is about, by the way. I'm <laughs> desperate while I'm seeking connection. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Or am I? I don't know. So what, what wait, a reporter, uh, what, how did that make you feel more connected? I mean, you're still fundamentally pretty alone. But you're always with other people, you know, you're always thinking about what other place can I infiltrate? What other community can I write about? What other phenomena can I explore? And you're sort of like a trickster, you know, and like in, in a mythological character, like creature that's just jumping uh, between all sorts of different worlds and feel and feel sort of okay with in all of them. So um, that was my dream job, by the way. That was like totally what I would have been doing um, if Russia was a different place. <laughs> and a little bit undercover. So like you weren't you were trying to, like you said, mythological creature trying to infiltrate. So t try to be a part of the world. What, what are we talking about? What kind of things did you enjoy writing about? I'd go work at a strip club or go. <laughs> 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 awesome. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I'd go work at a restaurant yeah. or just go write about, you know, um, certain phenomena or phenomena of people in, in, in the city. And what, uh, sorry to keep interrupting. I'm, I'm the worst I'm, uh, conversationalist. What stage of Russia is this? What, uh, is this pre-Putin, post-Putin? What What was Russia like? Pre-Putin is really long ago. <laughs> uh, this is Putin era. That's the uh, beginning of 2000s and 2010, 
2007, 8, 9, 10. What were strip clubs like in Russia and restaurants and culture and people's minds like in that early Russia that you were covering? In those early 2000s, it was, there was still a lot of hope. There was still tons of hope that, um, you know, we're sort of becoming this uh, Western, westernized society. Uh, the restaurants were opening, we were really looking at, you know, um, we're trying. We're trying to copy a lot of things from uh, from the U.S., from Europe, um, bringing all these things in. Very enthusiastic about that. So there was a lot of you know stuff going on. There was a lot of hope and dream for this you know new Moscow that would be similar to, I guess, New York. I mean, just to give you an idea, in um, year two thousand was the year when we had two uh, movie theaters in Moscow, and there was this one first coffee house that opened. And it was like really big deal. Uh, by 2010, there were all sorts of things everywhere. Almost like a chain, like a Starbucks type of coffee house, or like you mean? <laughs> oh yeah, like a Starbucks. I mean, I remember we were reporting on, like we were writing about the opening of Starbucks. I think in 2007, that was one of the biggest things that happened in, you know, in Moscow back <laughs> back in the time. Like it, that was worthy of a, of a magazine cover, and uh, that was definitely the, the you know the biggest talk of the town. Yeah, when was McDonald's? Because I was still in Russia when McDonald's opened. That was in the 90s. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember that very well. Yeah. Those were long, long lines. I think it was 1993 or four. I don't remember. Um, Did you you go to McDonald's at that time? Did you do the... I mean, that was a luxurious outing. That was definitely not something you do every day. And also the line was at least three hours. So if you're going to McDonald's, that is not fast food. That is like at least three hours in line. Yeah. <laughs> and then no one is trying to eat fast after that. Everyone is like trying to enjoy as much as possible. What's so your memory of that? Me. Oh, it was insane. How did this world? <laughs> Extremely positive. It's a small strawberry milkshake and a hamburger and small fries. And my mom's there. And sometimes I'll just, because I was really little, they'll just let me run, you know, up the cashier and like... <laughs> Cut the line, which is like you, you cannot really do that in Russia or so like for a lot of people, like a lot of those experiences might seem not very fulfilling, you know, like it's on the verge of poverty, I suppose. But do you remember all that time fondly? Like cause I do, like the first time I drank, you know, Coke, you know, all that stuff, right? Um and just yeah, the connection with other human beings in Russia, I remember. I remember it really positively. Like, how do you remember well, the '90s and then the Russia you were covering? Just the human connections you had with people and the experiences. Well, my my parents were both both physicists. My grandparents were both. Well, my grandpa grandfather was a um, nuclear physicist. Uh, professor at the university. My dad worked at Chernobyl when I was born in Chernobyl, analyzing kind of the everything after the explosion. And then I remember that, <laughs> and they were, so they were making sort of enough money in the Soviet Union. So they were not, you know, extremely poor or anything. It was pretty prestigious to be a professor, uh, the dean in the university. And then I remember my grandfather started making $100 a month after, you know, in the 90s. So then I remember we started, our main line of work would be to go to our little tiny country house, uh, get a lot of apples there from apple trees, <laughs> bring them back to to um, to the city and sell them in the street. <laughs> so me and my nuclear physicist grandfather were just standing there and he'd selling those apples the whole day because that would make you more money than, you know, working at the university. Okay. And then he'll just tell me, try to teach me um, you know, something about planets and whatever, the particles and stuff. And, you know, I'm not smart at all, so I could never understand anything. But I, I was interested as a, you know, journalist kind of type interest. And, but that was my memory. And, you know, I'm happy that I wasn't, um, I somehow got spared that I was probably too young to remember any of the traumatic stuff. So the only thing I really remember, I had this bootleg, that was very traumatic. I had this bootleg Nintendo, which was called, was called Dandy in Russia. Mm -hmm. So in 1993, there was nothing to eat. Like, even if you had any money, you would go to the store and there was no food. I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. And our friend had a um, restaurant, like a government 
her government owned something, restaurant. So they always had um, supplies. So he exchanged a big bag of weed for this Nintendo <laughs> that looked like Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember very fondly because I think I was nine or something like that, and or Why seven. Was traumatic? Because well, we just different. got it, and I was playing it, and there was this you know dandy TV show. Yeah. Um, so that traumatic show in a positive sense, you mean like uh, like a definitive? Well, they like, took it away and gave me a, ba a bag of weed instead, and I cried like my oh, eyes out for oh, I thought days it was the other and direction. days and days. Oh no! And then you know as a. And my dad said, we're going to like exchange it back in a little bit. So you keep the little gun, <laughs> you know, the one that you shoot the yeah. ducks with. So I'm like, okay, I'm yeah. keeping the gun. So sometime it's going to come back. Did but then they ever... exchanged the gun as well for some sugar or something. <laughs> I was so pissed. I was like, I didn't want to eat for days after that. I'm like, I don't want your food. Give me my Nintendo back. 